Sasha. How, how, how do you follow an act like that? At least I had some jokes. I noticed these balloons here. This must be the, uh, looks, looks like a Democratic National Convention, a blue balloon. This would be the Hillary balloon here, the transparency. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, um, we're going to talk about some serious, uh, some serious data here from a form of uh, uh, rest that is probably the least frequently used uh, and the least available. Uh, it's called dry flotation uh, rest. Um, and then we went back to uh, take a look at some of the uh, work that we started back in Antarctica, the first uh, rest research in Antarctica back in uh, the 1970s. We did the first EEG research, and that led to some, uh, uh, some laboratory chamber research uh, in my lab in New Zealand back then, where we were able to enhance hypnotizability, which is pretty handy to do because people, uh, there's a pretty normal distribution of hypnotizability, and when you want to use it for things like surgery or something like that, you may need more of it. I had a chance to practice that myself for uh, two and a half hours of surgery on my leg just about a, almost exactly a year ago, so watch the whole thing. So dry flotation rest. So we all know about this, but just you know, for those of you who are new to this thing, the, um, the term sensory deprivation goes behind all of, these, all of, the, all of the rest work, uh, work that uh, began. And that really began back in the 1940s through 70s, and sensory deprivation was associated with the North Koreans doing brainwashing and all sorts of things like that. Um, and uh, you know, it's basically some, a form of torture with severe psychological disturbances. And uh, there were studies done by people like Martin Orne where when, when they had uh, 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 panic buttons in, in the chambers so people could be released if they couldn't take it anymore, uh, well, we finally, we finally learned that that is not the case. Um, and um, back in uh, the 70s, um, uh, my colleague uh, um, Robin Gregson and I found uh, favorable responses to Antarctic wintering over isolation. And they were really scared about this. I mean, even going back to uh, Scott's uh, exploration of the pole, they took a dozen pairs of handcuffs with them in case people went nuts because of the sensory restriction. Seriously. Um, and then Peter Sudfeld argued that when the anxiety inherent in the early deprivation research was alleviated, um, chamber rest, at least at that point, becomes a powerful way to positively alter a variety of psychological and behavioral processes. And that's really before tanks were really much used. Um, by 1985, this is the big breakthrough for all of us here, uh, we finally had recognition in the, the textbook of psychiatry um, you know, the Bible for a psychiatrist and, and for the medical profession in terms of looking at this stuff as being beneficial rather than being a negative experience. So that's a real breakthrough. And as a result of that, all these introductory psychology textbooks, which you would usually would have uh, a page or sometimes, sometimes more um, about the dangers of sensory deprivation because there's this neat little picture of the chamber, you know, with all sorts of electrodes and so on. So the textbooks began to change about then, and that's, that's been terrific for all of us um, and for the public who gets to use us. So, as most of us here know, there are three types of rest. We have the chamber, we have wet flotation, and we have dry flotation. And we're going to talk mostly about dry flotation. Um, this is my chamber in New Zealand where we first enhanced hypnotizability. Uh, it took six hours of lighted rest uh, to enhance hypnotizability, and we're talking not just increasing it statistically significantly, but more than doubling standardized hypnotizability scores, which doubling test scores means nothing unless it really mean, unless it adds up to something else. So we used electrical stimulation pain, um, ferrotic shock actually, um, and uh, gave people a suggestion uh, for uh, uh, glove analgesia, so we could see whether or not the increase in hypnotizability would be reflected uh, in the actual response to the hypnotic, uh, hypnotic uh, suggestion. And we had people that had actually outperformed the machine, they're actually taking 900 volts. Luckily, the amperage is very low. Um, we'd, we, we like to minimize tissue damage in our work. Um, and it also lasted. So once people developed the ability to increase hypnotizability by learning how to focus their attention, um, it worked out really, really well to do this. So that's, that's our chamber. We had all sorts of instrumentation back then. We did EEG, we did uh, peripheral temperature, we did core temperature, we did um, skin conductance, did a variety of physiological measures, and we did see an increase in arousal, potentially reflects anxiety in the first, after around three hours, 
And then this really began to taper off and the beneficial effects began to kick in around four or five, uh, five hours um, to a large extent. That's chamber rest only. Um, then we tested wet rest. Um, and we used the standard 20% magnesium sulfate solution in a light-free tank. Um, and we had about 60 to 80% submergence. By the way, uh, I'll probably talk more about that in the Q&A. We eventually, in my lab at, at uh, Washington State University, which I've, which I've had for the last 30 plus years now, um, in our wet flotation work, eventually came up with a specific gravity, ideal one, being about uh, 1.26. So I think that fits some of the data presented yesterday, which is at 1.25, which is highly influenced by body fat. So there's the other variable that comes in. Um, in there as well. Obviously, you float better with more body fat. Um, and um, what we found out is that wet rest failed to enhance hypnotizability. Um, and it also failed to influence hypnotic suggestion for pain relief. Uh, so it didn't have any influence on hypnotizability. So, um, going back to our study that was published in 1982, which was from the New Zealand lab, uh, where we used uh, six hours of lighted chamber rest with Gansveld goggles, these goggles that allow light transmission, but you don't really get um, uh, the ability to focus on any kind of an image. It helps to keep you awake. Um, and then we also did another study uh, later, which was uh, Becky Dyer, uh, who's a, um, I think she's a colonel in the Army as a psychologist now. Uh, we employed three, six, 12, and 24 hours of unlighted chamber rest and we were studying uh, the effects on overeating. This is kind of a cool study in the fact that people got to take their favorite foods, like it might be um, Oreo cookies and ice cream, and that's all they'd get for the, for the period of time, the, the period of time they were, they were done. We even got permission. One of the subjects was a, uh, the wife of one of the faculty members, and her thing was wine and cheese or something. So we got permission to even give her as much wine as she wanted through that. Anyway, the end result is, in the longer periods, the 12 and 24 hours, they became averse to their problem foods. We also discovered that Becky became averse to all the different problem foods that people brought in. So she's uh, very thin. Um, so uh, so the kind of thing, that's the kind of thing you use that for. But uh, there was a lot of sleeping involved in that. And that was why we, conclu that we concluded, uh, it, I mean, we just guessed, I should say. It was not really a conclusion because we, did, we didn't systematically collect that data. Um, that you know, you're missing rest effects when people go to sleep. Whether you sleep in the tank, whether you sleep in the chamber, you're missing the rest effects in terms of having to develop imaginal activity. Um, so this blinding flash of the obvious got us to, uh, to guess that uh, S's exposed to lighted rest are less likely to fall asleep than those exposed to unlighted rest. And curiously enough, nobody actually ever checked this out. Uh, it's embarrassing when you think how many years uh, some of us have been doing this research have we, having not checked that out. And we were guessing that sleeping attenuates rest effects because what it does is shorten the time that people are engaged in trying to adapt to reduce stimulation. Adapting to reduce stimulation is where the benefit comes in. So we wanted to test this directly, and the study we're going to talk about today, I'll, I, will, I promise I'll eventually get to it, um, was to determine uh, the effects of lighted versus unlighted rest on hypnotizability, and we also used experimental pain as our criterion measure. Um, so uh, this is the way you have to conduct this research. You have, to, you have to have control groups. You have to have one condition versus another condition. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of effort to, to do these things. And we, only, we move ahead in little tiny, tiny steps. You know, we don't, you know, the breakthroughs are often things that we're not looking, looking for at the time. You know, research really, we always talk about proposing research, planning research, writing grants. Really, research is generally rescued rather than planned. Uh, what you find out is often things you stumble on. Um, anyway, all we did here, we had um, uh, university community volunteers. Uh, they didn't have, they weren't students at Washington State University. Some were, some weren't. We just take people from that community. Washington State University is in eastern Washington, if you don't know about that. Um, it's very rural. Uh, we have about 20,000 uh, students and about 12,000 other people, as we call them, and about eight miles away with the University of Idaho, which is another similar place. So it's very much a university, a couple of small towns. Um, 
and it's kind of an isolated area anyway. I mean, it's, uh, there's, there's uh, not a lot to do except uh, study and party. Uh, some, stu some students party more than anything else. I'm on the student conduct board. I'm just, I continue to be amazed at some of the things they do. Um, um, truly amazed. Um, and, um, and all the, um, I was gonna tell you this, no, I won't tell you this one. Um, um, anyway, all these subjects had experiences uh, with hypnosis beforehand. This is important when you do hypnosis research because when you get practice with hypnosis, um, you can't just, you don't just generally get a, a perfect measure of hypnotizability by measuring it. If I take one of you up here and test your hypnotizability with one of the standardized scales, like a Stanford scale, you know, we'll get a score, and it's probably going to be stable over time, but if you get more experience with it, you're going to get better or worse. You'll get to a plateau point. So it's good to have multiple experiences. So we did that, and that takes a lot of time. And that's about 12 to 18 hypnotic inductions before we could even start the experiment. Let's take a look at the dry flotation chamber. Um, and um, this one will be at float on, I think, in the not too distant future, maybe about a year on. Um, and uh, the big thing here is, uh, we had some discussion about that yesterday from Dr. Feinstein, and um, the uh, anti-vibration part of it is just incredibly difficult to engineer, and that's what makes these things very, very expensive. The anti-vibration legs are kind of a NASA development. It takes a lot of time to do that to reduce the sound transmission. And the walls in this are filled with sand, and the wood is finely finished. And we go through all kinds of, uh, all kinds of trouble, for example, even though, like when you... Uh, oil the wood, you don't use a petroleum byproduct, you use lemon oil. So you don't have any of those kinds of things influencing the environment. And then it has to sit for a long period of time, even with the lemon oil, till that goes away. Filtration, uh, the uh, uh, air filtration and negative ion generators and all that sort of thing, very similar, if not identical, to most of the ones you get with the wet float. And that's what the box looks like. And inside, uh, here, let's take a look inside here. Um, is a uh, bladder, uh, which is a non-aerobatic type of uh, uh, material. And on that is kind of a low tactile velour, which is uh, tested in a lot of different environments to do it. And you kind of sink into the bladder. It's not like sitting on it. It's not like laying on a waterbed at all. You sink into it as you do in a regular flotation situation. This is a great way to get people uh, into a wet float who don't want to try it or have had a bad experience initially. In other words, they've splashed the salt water, as we've all done in our eyes the first time, you know. And we don't, we're not, we don't bother, we're not bothered by that, but new people are. And so you can get them into a partial flotation situation to start with. So it's a nice introductory way of doing things. Um, and they don't have to take their clothes off or shower before and after and so on. So there's a lot less time involved in terms of running subjects through it that way. Uh, we gave them a Stanford Hypnotic Susceptibility Scale Form C. That's been normed since uh, on, in all sorts of different languages. We've done them in Taiwanese. We've done them in Japanese. We've done them in in, uh, uh, in Mexico with Mexican subject, which is different than the the, uh, the norming we did in, in Spain. Uh, it's the most widely used scale, extremely reliable. Uh, and then for the pain test, we used ischemic pain. Um, and what we do here is, is it's an experimental form of pain, and what you do is you wrap a blood pressure cuff around the, the subject and you inflate the blood, blood pressure cuff to, what is it, 200 and uh, something, uh, 250 millimeters of mercury. And uh, then you want to, of course, get the pain going, so we have them squeeze a hand dynamometer and uh, run a between 10 and, 10 and 20 pounds. We, the idea was to try to do 10 kilograms. Some people couldn't do that. And that really hurts. It's, it actually approximates the post-operative pain. This is developed by... Hilgard at Stanford uh, many, many years ago, and it's also a sim similar work uh, at Harvard, and the same thing we used when I was teaching at Harvard. And um, so we have this nice pain measure, and then we tell people, we take out our little timer, you know, and we ask them every five seconds to report on a scale of one to 10, where one, they're not feeling any pain, and 10, this is the point, they very much like to remove the cuff because it really, really hurts. So they're going, you know, two, four, six, Seven. And then we finally get to 10, and we say, oh, please keep reporting. Um, so we take it off, you know. Um, because if we just give them a 1 to 10, what will happen is we get heroes. People will give you 9, 9 and a quarter, 9 and a half. You know, they're going to show you. But if we open the scale up, we get linear data, which is really important for statistics. So we'll get people that report. People in hypnosis give you zero across the board. 
It's absolutely incredible. People without it will, by a minute and a half, they're in real agony with this kind of pain. So we have a nice experimental way of doing it, and um, um, we haven't hit any gangrene at all. We do get it off in time. <clears throat> Minimal tissue damage is our goal. Um, so we, the first group, uh, these, are, these are randomly assigned. Um, the, uh, to the uh, lighted condition, they did six hours in dry flotation. The Gansfield goggles, just like the standard chamber, but we have the dry flotation environment. Uh, we also use the same thing we did with the earlier hypnosis experiments to replicate them, you know, the ones that were done 30 years ago um, that we, we did. Um, we used uh, sound attenuating earplugs, they're about 30 decibels, and we used um, very, very low level white noise. Not invasive white noise, but very, very low level, and I don't have the exact uh, uh, level, sound transmission levels on that, but that's as, a, as an additional masking sound. Probably not necessary, probably not a good idea, but uh, that's what we did before and wanted to replicate exactly what we did with the straight chamber study. So we're not, in, you know, not introducing some variable that uh, wasn't, wasn't used before. Then we had the same in the, uh, the, same, uh, in the light free condition. In other words, we turned the lights out. And, um, and the group three was basically a control condition. And this is a casual classroom, one where it maintained social contact, and they had access to, uh, interactive media and that sort of thing. Um, now we monitored them by the intercommunication system, same thing we use in the wet float and same thing most people use in the uh, chambers. Um, we had to use the uh, criteria developed by Sanders and Ryer way back in the 60s to identify, quote, sensory deprivation uh, phenomena so people were experiencing these things, we would take them out of the environment. This is a leftover, once a human subjects committee at a university gets on to a protection for those subjects, even if it's irrelevant, by all sorts of data, it continues. It takes a life on its own. So, you know, so you look at this, nobody met the criteria, fine. So we can report again, nobody met the criteria, but nonetheless, the next experiment, they still want that applied. So that's how, you, that's how we get this ancient stuff in there. Um, and uh, basically what happened is this, quite simply, six hours of lighted dry flotation rest significantly increased Stanford hypnotic susceptibility form C scores and significantly reduced ischemic pain score. So they increased in hypnotizability and importantly, uh, they're able to take a lot more pain for a long period of time. And I'm talking by a lot more, I mean, the, you know, they're, they're reporting zero after a minute and a half, whereas the subjects are in the control group, we're, we're, we're way over 13, 14, 15, Within, within 30, 40 seconds. You know, try this ischemic pain thing. Be careful, though. No, no tissue damage. Um, and the lighted condition uh, was uh, statistically significantly uh, better in hypnotizability and pain relief scores, although both did work. The unlighted did work as well. So we did, in, the six hours is long enough to get an effect. So um, essentially, uh, this went back to the, an, an old theory that I had on this, and. The idea is that you have to have the person being awake in the rest environment for them to develop the um, focused attention that we need in hypnosis. What's hypnosis? Yes, there's all sorts of physiological data for it. We have, you know, we can talk about the anterior singlet and so on. It's simply this, over, oversimplified attention, you gotta be able to pay attention. Concentration, you have to, that means attention for a while. That leads to controlled imagination who is it controlled by, the sinister hypnotist? Hopefully not, no. It's controlled by you, okay? And so you have a choice, hypnosis gives you the choice. You can, for example, you can choose to experience the pain or you can choose not to. It's a new definition of hypnosis that uh, we just uh, developed at APA last year uh, when I was uh, president of the hypnosis division. You can Google it, it's right there. So uh, there we are. And um, that would be a very cold rest environment, I would think. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.